Hi folks, this is Morris Gleason from ISOG. I've tried to reduce the background noise in this video as much as possible, but you may need to adjust your volume levels in order to get the maximum benefit from the video. Have fun, thanks. Good morning everybody and welcome to day two of Who Do You Think You Are? Uh, sponsored by Family Tree DNA, which is uh, the stand just behind you. And um, uh, also what you're seeing here are volunteers from ISOG, the International Society of Genetic Genealogy, and the stand is just behind you as well. If anybody is doing a DNA test or has thought of doing a DNA test, please join the International Society of Genetic Genealogy. It's completely free. Uh, there's lots of resources, lots of help for you to interpret your results. And uh, most of the people that you see on the Family Tree DNA stand are volunteers like myself who are from the International Society. Now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker of today, who is Emily Olasino. Uh, Emily has a BSc in History, a Master's in Education, and she's a speaker and regional coordinator for the International Society of Genetic Genealogy, uh, administrator, administrator of the OGUN, One Name Study, a member of the Association of Professional Genealogists, and the Genealogical Council of Oregon. Um, now, DNA testing can appear to be a dark hole, an abyss of test choices terminology, confusion, uh, uh, and on how it aids your genealogy is a big question. But here to tell us how to get through this mire of questions is Emily. So please give Emily a big, warm welcome. Emily Olasina. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and one thing I wanted to add is I've also written a book. <laughs> it is for sale over at IZOG, uh, 16 pound, and it is really focused on the basics. So all of you who are rather new to this, it, you can find it very helpful. But I tell everybody, if you need to go to sleep, you start at the beginning. If you don't, then you use it as a reference. So you cover the chapters that talk about the particular tests you take until you can grasp all of the information then add to your uh, knowledge. But before I really begin, I also like to ask how many of you have already done a DNA test? Yes, I'm talking to the choir, eh? <laughs> and um, how many of you have done uh, the Y DNA test, either for yourself because you're male or, or for some of my friends are in the crowd, so I'm going to get huckled. <laughs> um, or, you know, for some of your family members. So how many of the Y? Okay. How about the mitochondria and autosomal? Okay. So um, some of you might find some information here that will really help. I try to cover all three, and of course we will have questions at the end. And so, let's start. As soon as I have to quit talking and get a picture taken. <laughs> Thank you, go away. Um, all right, so finding your way through DNA. Sometimes everybody thinks it's really somewhat of a quagmire. But I always say to my audiences, you've learned how to do genealogy, you can learn how to do this. I am not a science major. My was history, and I'm a retired teacher. And I had to learn on my own, as most of us at ISOC did. And we use it different than the geneticists anyway. So if you, if you can learn genealogy, you can learn this. It's like sometimes a little bit of a foreign language. Uh, so bite off pieces at a time, OK? So this is basically the agenda. We'll run through these things. Now, I do want you to look at your handout. I know some of you who came early did. And the reason being is I put a lot of information in the handouts. Why? Because we're not auditory learners. We are learners that are visual. And we need to go read. We need to see a lot of lectures in order to understand and really retain, retain this. And at one point, you're going to go, aha, I've got it. So, when you walk out of here, you may have lots of questions and hopefully the handout will help you. You also notice my email is there. All you need to do is email me, ask questions, and just say where we met. That way I have a little reference. So, we'll start first, and you may know all of this. How many of you not tested? I think we need to ask that question. Okay. Um, we need to know what genetic genealogy is, what it can do for us and what it cannot. It is the best tool that we have as genealogists, but it can't do everything. Nothing can do everything. So to run through this, it is the most accurate tool, like I just said. 
it is not a one size fit all tool. There are different tests for different uses, different parts of your, your genome, and we'll walk through some of that. It's a supplement to genealogy. The key word here is supplement, because it means you need to have your genealogy and you also need to have DNA to prove the accuracy of your genealogy. Now, I realize that we cannot DNA test every line of our genealogy, but to do what we can is going to help prove the accuracy of our research. And it's not that you did something wrong, it's that papers, um, handwritten man-made records have errors, even Bibles. Not a magic bullet. Your ancestors didn't tell you everything. Even some of your living ancestors haven't told you everything. And so we need to sort it out. Um, for instance, my second cousin's not my second cousin. Was all my life until we did an autosomal test. So don't test unless you want to know the truth. I like this part because we're genealogists, right? And that's my focus. I'm a genealogist first. And to find people to do research, yellow if I'm in your way, it, to find people that can share your DNA, you can work together with them, you can get family stories and sometimes photographs to add to your knowledge. Or you give that information to someone else. Oops. But it's not the answer for all brick walls. There's always going to be brick walls, and especially people in England and Ireland, because you know your records don't go back very far. Some people can get back to the 1700s or whatever, and, and maybe a little further, but a lot of people are stuck in the 1800s. So it's, there's always going to be brick walls. Sometimes this can help solve them. Always test to confirm, like I said. Um, it, it can prove and disprove lines of your genealogy. But before you decide to test, determine your goals so you'll get the right test. And a lot of people over at Family Tree DNA can help you focus on that. But decide, why do you want to test? What part of your uh, pedigree do you want to justify? You want connections with? So work on what, what are your goals? Eventually, it may be to do all the tests. But at the beginning, you may have one focus. It wants to be the all-male line, the all-female line, or everybody in between. This is a key. Some of us, when we learned to do genealogy, we were just working about our direct line all the way back. That's good, but it's not as helpful as doing all of the descendants of the people on your direct line. When you do that, you have a bigger database and you will find that it's easier to match with other people with whom you share DNA. It isn't a perfect answer, but you truly, truly do need to know as many of the descendants of your direct ancestors as you can. This is very important. Don't test unless you want to know the truth because some people are not who they think they are. And that's okay because, you know, your name changed. It could have been six generations back. It, and people change their names for many reasons. Don't assume that it's illegitimate or an adoption or whatever. Uh, I have a case of someone who was born in England, and he um, had the name Hodgkiss, but his DNA said it's Tally. Well, there were Tallies living in the area, so it could be what we call a non-parental event, or which I prefer saying not the parent expected, um, because every conception is a parental event. However, when he came to America, for some reason we don't know, he changed the surname to Lorraine. So don't be surprised. <laughs> Anything you can dream up can happen. So we're going to look at inheritance, because we're going to cover the three basic tests today. The pedigree chart for the all-male line, as you can see here, is going to be the father's 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 father. That is the Y DNA. Only men can take that test. And the female line is mother's 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 mother. No males involved, and both male and female can take that test because they receive the mitochondria from their mother. And then uh, we're going to cover these two, and then we'll go to the middle, all of the people in the middle. So the Y chromosome, this is a stylized 
view of the Y chromosome, and people are always asking me, oh, are there two parts? And all the chromosomes look basically like this. They have a little neck, I guess you could think of. It's called the centimere, and all it is is a useful purpose for when there's conception. Two of the chromosomes come together. There's a protein thread that winds around them. They spin, 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 and sometimes there's recombination. One uh, piece of one chromosome will go over to the other. Now, these are always the same chromosomes, like we'll explain later. But the point is, that's just the way it looks, and it's okay. So don't fret about the fact that it's got two parts. When you do the Y-DNA testing, you get the results that look like this. And people are going, okay, where do they get those numbers? What are those numbers? What do I do with those numbers? So we'll talk about that. I do want to point out that if... You see, this is at Family Tree DNA, because they're the only company that tests this, the Y chromosome, okay? And um, the markers that are in red mean they mutate or change, and the mutations we talk about in uh, genetic genealogy are not harmful to the species. So it's not that bad word, you're going to get three ears. It is the fact that part of your DNA changed a little, and those changes help put us, uh, help put everybody into smaller groups but these some of these markers change more quickly than others you don't have to worry about it you just have to understand that's why some are in red and some aren't but those numbers we're going to talk about where those numbers come from um, or from where they come can you tell I haven't teach, taught for a while anyway nucleotides there are four there are more but there are four major nucleotides in our DNA and they are adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. You don't have to remember those. We don't like to say those words, so it's ATCG. And I would tell my students at school, I didn't teach science, but if I were, did, um, how do we remember those? Because they connect together, as you can see. A always connects with T, C, and G always connect. It's like puzzle pieces that only fit one way. And if you really want to remember with, who connects to whom, it's C and G are curved letters, they connect. A and T are straight letters, they connect. You don't have to know this, I just want to explain what you could be looking at at some point. We have another term called short tandem repeats. Each marker has its own pattern, and it is a short pattern, about three to five of those ATGCs, right? This is marker 393 on the Y chromosome, I'm just talking Y, and the pattern is A-G-A-T. The geneticists only have to look at one side because they know what the other side is going to be. So they look for those patterns for marker 393. The trouble is there's more than one of those patterns because we got short, tandem, meaning side by side, and repeat. So this thing has got to repeat. And in this case, it repeated twice. You can see this is one, this is the other. However, every marker has its own pattern. Every marker has its own range of repeating. On 393, it repeats from 9 to 17 times. Ah, 9 to 17 times. Where do you think that 14 came from on marker 393? 14 times that pattern repeated itself. Make sense? So look down at 385A. Notice it is a red fast mutating marker. It has two parts. And one person received a 15, the other received a 16. So what happened there? One person got 16 patterns repeated. The other one, only 15. That's okay, depending on how many times those differences are when you compare the top line is one person, the second line is another person. And how many markers you've done and how many differences there are determines how close together you can be. And this is what we call genetic difference. The, word, the key word here is difference. We don't care if this marker went up or down. It's the difference between the two. And the difference between the two is one.
Now, I always like to throw in a few success stories because it encourages people. And this one happens to be from Wales and the U.S. connection. Um, Cliff was a, a man that would come to my presentations back in Oregon. I'm from Portland. And it took about three years to get him to test. And I'm going, Cliff, why? And I don't know if he suspected something. I don't really know. But finally he did test. And he had a brick wall, William, born 1775 and lived in Virginia. William had four sons, Jesse, John, William, and Joan. Jesse's Cliff's great-great-grandfather. And in 2010, Cliff had a match in the Wales. On the other side of the pond, in Wales, we had Jeffrey, who was born in Cardiff in 1945, and he was adopted by the Harris family. Well, he was watching a BBC documentary and about tracing the roots, and he decided to test. His wife was sort of encouraging him as well. And he did find his mother's birth certificate. The name was on the birth certificate, so he contacted her, and he did get to meet her in 2011 and asked about his father. And she goes, I think he was a Scotsman. In 2010, he came to Who Do You Think You Are in London and ordered a Y67 test. He received new clues about this time. A friend of the family said, you know, there was an American serviceman billeted in your grandfather's house. And others of the, you know, the family that they knew, the extended family, said, yeah, that's true. And so researching says that Jeffrey's third or fourth grandfather was one of William's sons. John, Jesse, William, and Joab. Well, Cliff had two half uncles that had service in England at the right time in the right place. The investigation continues because uh, two men can basically have the same Y DNA test most of the time. So now they're trying to determine which of the uh, people billeted in that grandfather's house could have been the father. So they're still working on it. But this man found his real surname and he found cousins in America and they visited each other. And here's a picture of Cliff and Jeff. You see some resemblance, don't you? I'm going to tell you, uh, it was it was either here in Dublin a couple of years ago when I came. I met Jeff with his lovely wife. We had great pictures taken together. And Jeff showed me a picture of Cliff's brother. They could be twins. Much closer in resemblance than Cliff even. And when Cliff got Jeff's picture, he sat on the couch and wore a plaid shirt. I said, that didn't help. That really makes you guys look more alike, but that's okay. <laughs> but it was fun. Anyway, another term we have is uh, single nuclear type polymorphisms. And, you know, we don't want to say that either. So we say SNP, or some people say SNP. SNP is easier. This is a particular marker that changes, mutates. And depending on what it is, it's how they help put you on the world family tree. We have a family tree with surnames. The world can't do that. So they use a series of letters and numbers. And it depends on which of these um, SNPs that you are. And this is only a tiny, tiny, tiny piece of the tree. So if you're an R, you have to test positive for all these crazy names uh, that are the names of SNPs. Not to worry about it, I just want you to know that that's how they determine your twig on the world family tree, which is called haplogroup. It's a combination of other people that are similar to you because they have tested these um, markers and they test positive, or, and wherever it lies, it's going to be much bigger. Uh, so they can tell you that all of you are this haplogroup. So. And this was a little small version again of haplogroups, and they've changed. Um, 
to use a what we call terminal SNP. It means the most recent SNP for which you've been tested. But we start out with the R, and so you may see in your test R-M207. Then if you're an R1, it goes to this SNP, M173, and it keeps going on and dividing. So every branch in the tree, it's an A and it's a B and, and whatever, we keep going. So all the way around until they get to the end. Now, here's another success story that deals with Ireland. And it happens to be my line. My maiden name is Doolin. My cousin, I had him take the test for me, right? And we're stuck in Virginia about 1740. Most of my lines came over in the 1600s, 1700s. Or, I'm sorry, 1760. Uh, I had a parental cousin, Doug, who tested for it. And he kept matching Doolin's. It's okay. So I know there's no NPE. I am a Doolin. However, he kept matching six other names. And I moved him up to a Y111. Still six other names. The same names. Kelly Lawler, blah, blah. And so then I did some SNP testing, remember that single nucleotide polymorphism, to narrow his twig on the world family tree. Then I did a new test they called the big Y. And when I did, the haplogroup people, because uh, you can join a haplogroup project, and they said, oh, well, we have a big Y from the Moore, from the Kelly, from the Lawler, from the O'Dowling, from everybody. And they determined that really the Doolin was originally an O'Dowling and that we are one of the seven steps of County Leash. Okay, fine. And that's great. Um, I do know that in 1641, the Brits were trying to break up the steps in that area. I don't know if my ancestor lived there. Last October, a man in London tested. His name was O'Dowling. He matched my cousin really well, especially for the timeline, but I had to move up to a higher level. He agreed to take the big Y test, definitely related. Looking at his pedigree chart, he has it back to 1795, all in County Leash. So I'm feeling a little confident that at some point in time, my line came from County Leash. I may never find it because of the records, but it sure is better than having anything could happen beyond 1760. So no paper trail yet, but from County Leash to a small county in Virginia. The mitochondrial DNA, that's the mother's 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 line, remember? Now, I am English, Scottish, Welsh, a little bit of German, and Irish. And I'm telling you folks, this is the mitochondria, but those are actually potatoes. They look like potatoes, don't they? <laughs> so the, the point here is the mitochondria is outside the cell of the nucleus. The uh, sex chromosomes are inside. Mitochondria is outside. And people get it mixed up with the X sometimes. And we'll talk about the X later. Again, the inheritance is the mother's, mother's, mother's line. Both males and females get their mother's mitochondria, so males and females can test for this. This is what their markers look like, totally different. In Family Tree DNA, who's the only company that does this test, even though some companies give you the twig on the world family tree, they don't give you matches. As you see at the top, there's the RCRS. That is the re revised Cambridge reference system. I won't go into great detail since this is basic, but there was a placenta from a live birth that was donated to Cambridge University, and it's the first time the entire mitochondria was sequenced. Then they later found out there was some contamination from bovine cell, cell, cells. Hell, they don't know how it happened, so they, they fixed it, and that's why it's called revised. But what I want you to look at is that twig on the world family tree is an H, and that is the most popular uh, female haplogroup at the moment. Now, they compared everybody to that sequence, to, to the RCRS, and this is what the marker looked like, and it had recognize the, the letter, ATGC, after it, this person is me, 
and I have thymine. That means the original person either had a C or a G. Because you can't, you know, do it mostly the other way. Well, later on, a person that works for in conjunction with Family Tree DNA decided to take it all the way back to the oldest DNA for females that we have, and who is called mitochondrial Eve. However, that is just in honor of the religious version of Eve, and they have one for Adam too. But look at the difference. You see what mitochondria Eve had at the beginning, the C, on the same marker, and I still have the T. Those long letters, that is the name of the marker. It starts from 1, it goes to 16,569. So this is the name of the marker, in this case, 16,256, and then of course it's got that um, base, nucleotide base. So that's what that looks like. And if you notice, this is the same piece of the mitochondria DNA. And I don't have very many differences if you compare me to the H. If you compare me to the, the person way back, many more differences. That makes sense. There's several hundreds of thousands of years or tens of thousands of years between the two sequences. Uh, in the people. Okay, so <laughs> we're genealogists. We want to find the common ancestors. We just, you know, a bunch of numbers, yay, but you need to look at what those numbers are. To find the common ancestor for Y or mitochondria is rather easy. Again, you want that wonderful pedigree chart that's filled out as much as you can. But you basically email because you get the names and you get the email of the people and it's their direct email um, of those who match you. And so you want to compare all of your pedigree with theirs. So you contact them, email them, compare that. And But the thing to remember is you may not match on the direct line. Let's, say, let's take the Y for example. I'll show you a couple examples here. But it may be an uncle who had a son or a great-great-grandfather who had a male line come down. So it would be not your particular direct line. That's the reason to do the descendants. You always want to contact the more recent um, matches first. How do you know what's more recent? We're not talking when they tested. We're talking the genetic difference. If you have a perfect match with someone, that genetic difference is a zero. If there is one difference, remember I showed you in the slide with one difference, then it's going to say one or two or three. Contact the ones that are zero first and then work your way up because they will have more of a match with you. But you don't know how far back in time until you compare pedigree charts and find the common ancestor. But definitely just contact them, share your genealogies. Here's an example. So you have a woman, and she wants to get her father's DNA. What is she going to do? She doesn't have the white chromosome. So she looks and says, just, she doesn't have any brothers. So she looks at her father's brother, and then work the line down all the way through the male and find somebody living to test. We always have to test the living unless you're really rich and get the permission of the government, right? But as you can see, the father had a sister, even if the sister had a male, that's not going to be the father's Y chromosome. That would be the sister's husband's chromosome, Y chromosome. So you have to be very careful that it's all male. And again, let's say you couldn't find anybody that was living at all, what we call daughter doubt. It means they didn't all ended up with living daughters and no males. So then you go back one more generation and start bringing down an all male line until you find a living male. I caution you and I say to you, follow all the male lines down if you're doing Y or follow all the female lines down because you never know when you're not going to find a living person. There'll be a dead end. And you may be able to use one and not the other. A quick example is I was testing a man. I talked to two of his brothers. They didn't want to test until I got to the third one. He wanted to test. 
We may have to go through that. So, this one is like, here's the, the couple, and we know this couple had a man and he married. And this couple had a, uh, the original couple had a son and he married. So we have to follow the lines down. All the green lines mean it's going to work because it goes to a male. And then, of course, that's his wife next to him. And so you can see that we can work this one down and get a tester because it's a male to a male to a male all the way down. This one not so because it goes over to a female. But it goes back to a male. As you can see. It had a girl, then girl had a male, doesn't matter. Can't do it. And this one the same thing, different generation. And the other one we found another tester, possibility. Okay. For females, same principle. We start out with some grandparents, great grandparents, whatever and again follow it in this case there were two daughters and the daughter is married it's looking good over here but this they also had a son we're looking at all female right now so there is a daughter here's a daughter here's a daughter and again that line goes down we have a tester this line no because it's, there's a cross to a male then back to a female, then back to a male. Not going to work. This one goes all the way down female, works. This one does not. Same principle. Male, male. So you really have to make sure all female or all male. Now, the last time I took French was in ninth grade in high school. I'm old. And so I'm going to butcher these names. <laughs> Forgive me. Um, Elise uh, of Montreal ordered an mtDNA test from National Geographic and that is another company in the US that was doing things for a while but they do more ancient uh, genealogy um, not genetic genealogy and you can transfer that to family tree DNA so that's how come this was working anyway her results uh, exactly matched another person on the mitochondria and her name was Lynn and she lived in California and um, she had tested through uh, the French Heritage DNA Project it's a Canadian French situation and uh, Lynn had posted 12 generations of her direct mitochondrial line the French Canadians have a lot of good records So Elise joined the French Heritage Project, and um, her common ancestor with this match, this is where I go to butcher it, is Francois Garnier Jenner. And um, the spouse of that person is Noelle Lengois. That's close, anyway. I'm getting the nod back there from my Frenchman. <laughs> Um, anyway, the two cousins were introduced only as a result of DNA. And can you imagine somebody handed you, you know, a X number of generations? I mean, one was back to 12, the other wasn't. Wonderful reason to test. Now, the autosomal test is my favorite and many, many people's. Um, we have, what's to understand here is we have two chromosomes that both have the same name. These are ordered from um, 1 to 22 due to size. And so we have 22 pairs of autosomes. That's where we get the word autosoma. And family tree DNA, it's called family finder. Then we have the X and the Y, which are the sex chromosomes. And we'll talk more about all of that. But what I wanted you to see was the fact that they're pairs. That's important to know, they're pairs. You get one from mom, one from dad. And then the sex chromosomes down here. The females get two X, the males get one X and one Y. One comes from mom, one comes from dad. And we know the Y comes from dad, right? If women had a Y, we would be males. So I had a, somebody in my audience ask, why can't I test? Because you don't have a Y chromosome. This is my great grandmother in the blue, and her, my grandmother sitting to her right. And this is great grandmother's children. It is an old picture, I apologize. 
But what I want to tell you is that autosomal DNA, we get some from each of our parents. We get 50, about 50% from each parent, and then, of course, their ancestors, they got 50%, but we have less uh, from each of our generations back. It virtually cuts in half, however, it won't be exact that you uh, inherit 25% of each of your grandparents. That doesn't work that way. However, autosomal DNA does give us our traits as well as a lot of other things. But I want you to notice here, one son has small ears, this one has large ears. So we can look like our siblings, but not exactly. That's autosomal DNA. And if you notice, my grandmother has no widow's peak on the far left, and one of her brothers does. So they may have noses that all look alike, but not necessarily every feature. Even identical twins, can they can find places in their DNA where there are differences, or their DNA, pardon me. So a few terms we have to learn. This is all in your handout, so don't sweat it. It's pretty simple. Um, we have to determine HIR. It's half identical regions. Remember I said you get one chromosome from mom, one chromosome from dad? Well, you have to determine from where it came. Now, remember the ATCGs? Here's the pattern. And this person matches this person on that link. So it can look like this on there. Uh, chromosome 20, and there's where it starts because each of these have a number, and this is where it ends. And this is how many centimorders, we'll talk about that. There are cases when they, when they match a pretty good link, we call it IBD, which is identical by descent, that means you inherited it. And in this case, Kathy, Doug, and Dan all match each other. But when you look at that, you should always look at three people. You have to take the highest start position and the lowest end position. Because then you can commonly say that all three of those people have this suction. And that suction, if they all match each other, and you email them and say, hey, do you match the other person here? If they all do, you will all have a common ancestor. So you compare all of your pedigree charts, and that's it. Then we have something called IBS, identical by state. And this one, there's some controversy about how people explain this. It is inherited. We inherit all of our DNA. But these segments, these pieces are so small, you'll never find the uh, common ancestor. And as you can see, the centimorgan is really low. So you find a bunch of these. I found three there, but look, I know it has to be IBS for two reasons. It's very small. and Here's the other people to match. That's too many people matching. It's not going to work. <laughs> so that was a piece of DNA that was handed down generations ago, virtually unchanged. Or it's a common piece of DNA for a common population. But it's too small. Centimorgans, this can be more complicated. You have all that in your handout. But what I want you to think about is the larger the centimorgan, the more closely you are related. So it's short of a measurement of quality. And there is the more correct definition, but you can see it in your handout as well. So what do you do with autosomal? This is the fun one to play with. Before people really started mapping, I started just using logic. And I tested my cousin Doug. He relates to me on my grandparents and my father's side. And I just reasoned that if Doug and I matched this other person, and the other person matches Doug and I, then it has to be on that part of my pedigree chart further back. Well, that's great. I just cut my work in half, but that's only in half. So I added Dan, and if Dan and I and even Doug match, because we all are related to Ben and Tina, then I know where to start looking. I am not going to leave my mom out, so I tested this person so I could go from their back if we match, and the same here. You can find a lot of common answers just by doing that. The more people you test, like first to third cousins, sometimes fourth cousins, it helps. You can download your matches spreadsheet, and this will give you the names of all your matches, the emails, a bunch of other things here, as you can see. Um, and the total centimorgans that you share, and the largest centimorgan that you share. 
And you, what you want to look at is the largest symptom word. The known relationships, any names they put in, and you can make notes. Then you can download, and these are into spreadsheets, there are free spreadsheets out there, um, your matching segments. Here's the fun. When you do, you're going to take away everything that is five, uh, below five centimorgans. Never because it's too small to deal with. Even above that can be too small. And if you're beginners, you need to start with around 15 centimorgans. Order it in chromosome. So this is chromosome three. And then I ordered it in start position, stop position. And then I start looking at them and I'm going, whoa, all of those people look like they can match each other. They're, they're basically the same range. They probably don't all match each other because some of them could be on my mother's side, some of them could be on my father's side. So I email everybody and I say, hey, do you match all these other people? Those who say, yes, I match that person, blah, 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 then we have a common ancestor. The ones that say, no, I don't match those, then I know it's on the other side. So it can split like that. And then here's another one, same principle. Finding common ancestors, again, we talked about the highest and the lowest, and that's all that is. Uh, with these three people, they all match each other. Remember, it's my two cousins and I. But we all match each other only on this segment. And then we can determine who gave us that segment. What I do is I download those spreadsheets, and then I add columns, because I want to customize it to make my life easier. So I add columns. And I, a lot of times what I add is, who's the common ancestor? Once I decide, but often it's a common couple. And then um, I want to record that because I don't want to go back in another pile of paper on, or on my computer to remember who was who. So I create the new column of known ancestors and then this is how I record it. You do it however you wish. I have a lot of Williams lines, so I don't always say Williams you know, the male, Simpson, the female. Sometimes I use the initials of the person and a birth date. I'm done. <laughs> Five minutes, okay. Here we go. So basically, remember that it's always an ancestral couple. I can't tell you without further um, testing cousins that who would it be if Doug, but now I can narrow it to here, but Ben and Tina, so I have to keep narrowing it. So I need to find a descendant of Ben or Tina that doesn't, relate to the other. X chromosome inheritance, we're going to flip through a little bit. It's different. And I, you have all the URLs, everything. Uh, Blaine Benninger did this chart for us. Males inherited differently than females. And so this is the male chart. You guys have it easy. You only get an X from mom. So all the pink and blue are the only people who can give you X. Why? Because a man, this would be blue, cannot give it to a man. Does that make sense? And then females, we got to work a little harder because we get an X from mom and an X from dad. But again, it's not everybody in your pedigree chart. Here's an example. These are pictures of my mother, grandmother all the way back. And I match Rebecca. I took the biggest seg segment. Always worked with the biggest. And I plotted my lineage on the fan chart. I knew she was on my mother's side because I know who she is, but I didn't know who gave us the DNA. Then I plotted hers, and there's a name the same. That's the most recent person that gave us that segment of DNA. Kurt and I, same principle. But look, there's a man in here. That's okay, as long as he's the right one. So I plotted it again, and I knew he was back a few generations, so watch for the same name. Happened to be Helen. So now it looks like this, and I just created this chart so I can see, okay, Kurt goes back to Helen, gave us that piece of DNA, and Mary Olgan gave us this piece. This is a good chart you can look at. The thing I want you to know is that fourth cousins, you have a 50-50 chance of matching people. Okay. Um, my success story, too. My, my most recent ancestor came over in 1848 from Donegadee. Northern Ireland. And uh, her husband was Gilmore. Her name 
maiden name was Storier, and that came from um, County Angus, Dundee. So anyway, I found a guy that was living in nearby county in New York, where they first settled, named Storier. And he's the guy where I had to talk to the third brother, and he tested. He didn't match me. He's a fourth cousin. I have a 50-50 chance, but he didn't match two other people that I matched. And that's the only line we can connect to. We have all the descendants. So, A plus B, you know, A equals B and B equals C, so A, B, and C are related. Duh. Um, I said your ancestors don't tell you everything. This is recent. This is my, my husband's line, and I can talk about him. He's not here. Um, this is his mother, and this is his mother's sister, Connie, on the left. This woman was said to be their sister who was given away when she was young because mother died when, when uh, Vivian was six months. She was given away to the friend of the family. She was raised as a girlfriend of the two sisters. I go to Italy. I'm talking to the family, and they're going, no. No. Mom got out. Well, after most of the family died, one of the cousins come up to me and said, I know who Vivian's father is. I go, thanks. Now you tell me. Well, I looked through the census. The guy was living in the household at the right time. I swabbed Vivian and my husband, because my husband has her mitochondria, and uh, she's a half an aunt. Basically, each type of test provides something different from your genome. You need to have your goals. You need to determine which company best suits you, and the only one that does these, all three tests, family tree DNA, the only one. Don't test if you wish not to know the truth. But have fun. It is fun. Okay, and I, you really, really, really do need to read sources. Go check out a Family Tree DNA's free webinars, and my book is on sale over at IZOG, as I had said. But there are other books out there, too, and those books might um, resonate with you. So try more than one. That's it. Questions? Great. Thanks, Emily. Um, you gave a really good uh, example of how you can actually apply DNA in practice. Uh, are there anybody, anybody in, the question, in the audience have, have questions for Emily? How many people here have actually done an autosomal DNA test? Quite a few people. And have you had matches? You had close matches as well? So it actually helped you break through brick walls in the family tree? Very good. Very good. Um, so any questions at all? We yes. have one question here in the front. Matches of, like this, but he's only got one match on the system. But we understand it's because they might be German <coughs> and they haven't tested. And just to, to, to say to people, it's the on the Y DNA and the haplogroup is R, which means it's Western European, and the actual terminal SNP is Z9. So that's going to be somewhere on the human evolutionary tree on a downstream branch. And Western, am I on? Western European, Western European is Germany too. You know. But let's remember this DNA happened before political lines as well. And people moved around them much more than you think sometimes. And yes, it can be. Um, I don't have all of them memorized. <laughs> you can check online uh, for the haplogroup tree, and uh, there's sometimes information for them too. And hopefully, he, uh, he belongs to the haplogroup that's related to that. Yeah. His haplogroup. Oh, he wasn't matching. They said, oh, that test done. But it didn't help because there hasn't been enough people tested. A lot of it, and or he had some unique markers. My husband had absolutely no Y matches for 18 months. I know people who still don't. After 18 months, he did get one. Wonderful match, came from the same place in Italy. However, he has like maybe 20 autosomal, which is so unusual because people have hundreds to thousands. And I thought he has some unique markers. Plus, it's Italian, and the Italians, you know, they hold it close to their chest. They don't really test much, and we've not infiltrated greatly in Italy. <laughs> so, time. Give it time. Uh, another point, of course, is that because Family Tree DNA have been shipping internationally for much longer than the other companies, you'll probably find that if you have European 
ancestry, you may have more matches in the family tree DNA database than you might have in the other databases. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, a ch it's changing all the time, but certainly for a long time, family tree DNA, because they were the first to ship internationally, uh, they have more European matches in their database than some of the other companies. When we first did it, and we come back, we look at it at certain times. We're not on it all the while, but we find it changes that previously we were over in Mongolia, but now that isn't there now. That's disappeared, and we've gone over to um, like Denmark or somewhere. That's what I don't understand how it can change from them testing the first time, and then they seem to update, and we seem to be moving to different areas. Okay. That's, that's because the ethnic estimates are just broad brush strokes, and it very much depends on the reference population they're comparing your DNA to. And if those reference populations get bigger, get better, get more refined, then so will your ethnic estimates get more refined. And it's going to become more and more precise and more detailed over time, and they're going to uh, drill down to even finer and finer detail, and uh, they'll go from the regional level to the country level to the uh, sub-regional level or sub-national level. So, for example, with Living DNA, they can tell you which county your English ancestors came from. And, and we're, going to be, we're going to have similar data for the Irish in due course as well, sometime in the next uh, 12 to 24 months or so. So it's getting better all the time. So you will see changes in your ethnic estimates. All right. So do expect that. It is getting better all the time. And you get the ethnic es estimates from the autosomal test, Family Finder. Each company, um, you know, 23 million and Ancestry, they do it also. And I've tested with all of them. And the, uh, the results in the ethnic department will vary from t each company because they choose different populations. And they ref some are more refined than others. Uh, and over time, it will change again. The percentages will change. And don't forget, it's all zonal. So you and your brother or sister are going to have some differences. Any other questions? Okay, well, I think you've certainly given a great introduction to genetic genealogy and the basics and given everybody a, a wonderful basics, basis for going forth and actually doing their own DNA test. So can I ask you to show your appreciation for Emily Olasino, please? Thank you. I, I want to add one thing. Those of you guys who were standing, I do have more handouts. I don't want to cart them home. So, and I have books over there, and I don't want to cart them home. This stuff is heavy. So please, just come up and grab.